class. So I would like to thank to everyone to come. I mean, the, the, thank you for for being here at CIMA. It was a big pleasure, as you can see. Today and yesterday was a big disaster because of, uh, of the, it's a touristic place and uh, and uh, today is a bank holiday. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Juan and Sergio and uh, Renato, for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, also to meet uh, uh, old friends from the uh, Philobidic group. So I will talk about uh, less passage population. And uh, yeah, some, somehow my, my lecture will be complementary to the what Eric is also going to uh, talk. And uh, so please also feel free to stop me and ask me questions. So this, this mini course is mostly uh, uh, for students and uh, that's, that's the aim of, I think, of this. Uh, so please uh, stop me if you have any questions, okay? So let me, uh, let me introduce you the model. So I will start with the, what we call the point-to-point -point model. And uh, so the basic ingredients, so the first one is what we call the environment, which is a, just a collection of uh, IID uh, random variables with exponential of parameter one uh, distribution. And uh, that's what we call the site passage time. So you imagine that uh, you, know, you were going to travel from X to Y and, uh, and every time you pass through a site, then you pay or you spend some time, which is given by this uh, variable here, omega z. Okay? So uh, what I'm interested in here is the last passage time. So I will maximize over all possible paths. But I'm only, uh, I will only consider oriented paths, what we call the up and right paths. So this is a picture of one possible upright path. So I go from X to Y, doing paths to the right, uh, steps to the right or steps up, like this, okay? So of course you have a finite uh, number of such a paths. And so you can define the maximum over all possible uh, travel time. So the travel time, so the, the side passage time is given by this random variable. And for each upright path, you have the sum along the path of the passage times. This is what we call the path passage time. And the last passage time is just the maximum that you can, uh, that you can get from this collection. Okay? So this is another uh, example of an upright path. And uh, so I will, uh, I will focus on what we, so it's the title of, the, of this mini course on, on geometrical aspects. So, when uh, fundamental property of, of the last passage times is that they somehow, they behave like a metric. So they have this uh, super IDT property, which means that the last passage time from X to Y is always bigger or equal from the last passage time from x to z plus the last passage time from z to y. Okay? So you can think of that as some sort of metric. Of course, for the metric is the other way around. But, uh, you can also consider first passage time, the uh, percolation models, but I, I will focus on this, on this last passage model because it has some special properties that we will see uh, soon. And so in this geometrical context, what we call, so the, we have geodesics. So the geodesics are just the paths which uh, maximize the travel time, okay? So, it's a, so the, the last passage times is given exactly by the sum over the geodesic of the passage times. 
And, and here, of course, we have uh, almost surely uniqueness of geodesics because we have you know, a continuous distribution for the passage times. So the probability that two, two, two paths have the same, uh, two distinct paths have the same passage times is zero. So with probability one, we have a unique path which maximizes this, uh, this uh, functional here. Okay? So that's what we will call the geodesic. So normally I will call it geodesics just to, you know, to call attention to, to, uh, that this is the path which maximizes the, the last passage time. So for instance here, so the geodesic I, I just painted red. Okay? Okay. So you, you can also define what we call the curve two-point model. And uh, so the setup is as follows. So I start with uh, a downright uh, path here. It's not anymore an upright. It's a downright. So, so this is the orientation. I start here, and then I go down. I can go right, down, right, down, right. And I, so this path will, will live not on the, the lattice, Z2, but on the dual lattice. Okay, so that's what I wrote here. So this is it's a, a path which lives in the dual of the Z2. Okay? So and then I, I, will, I, I, wish, I wish to define uh, the curve two-point last passage time. And what I will do is just similar procedure. So I will uh, take a point Y to the right of this, uh, of this path. And I will look at, uh, at paths that start at those corners. Here's where I put colors and end up at Y. So I will look at all paths from the corners of the, this, uh, this eta path and then that goes to, uh, from this corner to Y. So I have a, like, so this is a, a, for instance, this is one path, this is another path. So I have the, this collection here, what I call P eta of Y, it's just a collection of all possible paths from here to Y. Okay? And then I will just maximize again over all possible uh, paths of the passage times along the path. That's what we call the less passage percolation time, the curve to point less passage percolation time. Okay? And I, again, I have a, a unique path, which I will call the geodesic, which maximizes this, uh, this functional. Okay? So, of course, you can recover the point to point. For instance, if you so, if you consider, for instance, this initial uh, this initial eta, then of course you, you you only have one corner. So the curve to point with respect to this eta is just the point to point last passage time. So this is a more general setup for less passage reflection time. Okay? So then again I will, so for instance from, from this point Y, so suppose this is the geodesic from eta to the curve two point geodesic from uh, here to the here. So I, I will, so, as, so I put, you see that I put colors on the corners, so I will paint the geodesic according to the corner, uh, the color of the corner. So for instance, this geodesic here start uh, at the red uh, corner, so I paint it red. So for instance, if I have this, the geodesic from here to eta start at the green uh, corner, color, uh, corner, so then I, I will paint it green, okay? So, um, So the most fundamental result on this uh, type of model is that you have, uh, you can use the, the subadditivity ergodic theorem to actually um, show some sort of law of large number for L. It says that uh, if you uh, start with, um, take the limit as n goes to infinite of L, for instance, from zero to point 
n x n y and then you divide it by n then you have a limit almost surely which is given by a function f of omega is 2y and this function is a deterministic function i will talk a little bit more about that but i will not focus on this uh, type of result i think eric will spend some more time explaining you why how you get this kind of result and and um, and normally it's a very hard problem to compute f for general passage time distributions. But in our case, we can actually compute what is f. And um, yeah, let me just mention something that will also appear here and in this talk and also maybe in some other talks, which is the, so this is, you can see this as some sort of law of large number. And of course, you, you are also interested in fluctuations for this model. And so then you have this famous uh, universality columns. So every time I mention KPZ, I mean that this, the KPZ, uh, the, what we call the Kadaparizi Zhang universality class. And uh, uh, so, what, what, so what, what, what is this? So this is kind of a, a big collection of models where the fluctuations somehow goes to the same object. Okay, like, like you have like Gaussian universality class. You have like bunch of models where when you look at the fluctuations, they have like Gaussian fluctuations. So in this, in this context, the fluctuations are governed by what we call the KPZ universality class. And uh, so basically we have this uh, the theorem from uh, Johansson from I think it was two, 2000, which was, it proves that uh, you have some limit as n goes to infinite of L from, I will just see it, n, n minus uh, this n times f of 1, 1. In this case, it's just 4. We will see when it's 4. And uh, then you divide by some by n to the 1 third. And this has a limit in distribution is given by the trace rhythm um, GUE distribution. Okay, so this is just one example of object that lives in this universality class. But it will arise, you know, it will uh, come uh, later also in our talk. Okay, so these are the somehow the uh, fundamental, some fundamental results for this uh, model. And uh, so, I will, so what I want to talk here is, so how you can relate some, 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 some sort of ge geometrical objects that also arise in this model with this, with this kind of uh, behavior. So the first uh, object that I'm, I'm interested in to study what is what we call the, the geodesic forest. So just recalling you, I was, so I consider this uh, initial, um, uh, this initial interface here and then I have this geodesics from points to the interface, to the curve, and I'm, I'm coloring them. So for instance, this one was red, this was green, and then I just keep continuing doing this. I will have this uh, bunch of trees. Okay, so this is, so all the, all the points here, the geodesic from here to eta start at the red corner. So I paint it red. So the points here, all the points here, the geodesic from this point to the corner, or to the, the curve, start at the red corner, so I paint them red. So I have this uh, forest with colored trees, okay? And I, so there are some basic questions concerning this, uh, this object, and uh, we will see how we can uh, study this. Uh, for instance, what is, 
what is the probability that this, this, the tree, uh, the red tree will percolate is infinite, for instance. What is this probability? Can you compute it? And uh, this kind of question that we will see here. So this is, you, of course, you can also uh, consider this type of model on general less passage percolation. I mean, I, you just put some continuous passage time distribution. You can just construct the same type of object. You can also cons uh, consider uh, the, same, uh, the same model uh, with first passage percolation. Instead of maximize, you minimize. And you also, it's also, uh, you know, you can also consider uh, models which arise from the, the PDE context with random forcing. And uh, so just an example from, I think Yuri will uh, talk. Uh, did, I, did I put the H in the? the Oh, okay, there is no S, yes. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, I will correct it. Uh, oh, burger. oh, yes, there's an R after, a, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I'm happy that I put the H in the rest. <laughs> Burgess is not here, so I don't really. <laughs> okay, so this is a picture that the UD, uh with his student. Uh, this is a simu real simulation of uh, what you get when you consider the geodesic forest in the context of uh, this, the Berg's equation with random forcing. So I really like this picture. So, so. Okay, so the questions that I, I was mentioned before is that, for instance, so tau zero here is the tree that start at zero, the red tree. So what, what so does it percolate? So can we, uh, so what, what I mean by percolate, percolate means that this tree is infinite. It, it just keep growing forever. So this is one important question. So in case that, uh, of course, this, the behavior of these trees, they, 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 behave, they, they, they depend on the environment, but they also depend on the, the geometry of the initial curve. Okay, so it might be possible that with probability one, all these trees are finite. Okay, and we will see an example uh, where this actually happens. When you have like flat curve, we will see that this is, that the size of the trees are all finite, almost surely. But we might expect some sort of power law behavior. So they, they almost surely they are finite, but if you take the, the height of the tree, for instance, how long does it go? So this probably will have uh, expectation infinite, infinite expectation and we'll have some you know, very heavy tail behavior. So can we compute what is the behavior of, of the tail? Can we compute the, ex the exact exponent of that? And uh, any possible connection? So if you, we try to do some scaling of these trees, so can we get any connection with the, the KPZ in you know, the solids class? So this is the type of uh, question that we are interested in. So I will first, focus on this, uh, on this question. And maybe on the third uh, lecture, I will go on, on fluctuations, okay? And this, this just relates to these two questions here. Okay, so this is another picture. This, uh, here I took a different uh, initial curve, which is what we call the flat one, which is just, I go just right and down, right and down, right and down, right and down. And in this case, we will see that uh, almost surely this tree here is finite, and uh, we want to somehow study how, what is the probability distribution of the, the height of this tree, how long does it go, and uh, this kind of question. Okay, so another, uh, oops, another object that uh, I we will study here is what we call the, the competition interface. And uh, the construction of the competition interface is very similar to what I just did before with the geodesic forest. So now, for instance, take this, this initial uh, curve for the last passage percolation model. So in this, curve, in this initial curve, of course, I only have two corners. So the, this is the red corner and this is the blue corner. And so, of course, I only have two trees here. And then I'm interested on the interface between these two trees. So what is the geometry of this interface? Does it, has a, does it have a, an asymptotic uh, direction? 
or can I, can I somehow compute it? Uh, what is the limiting law? This kind of uh, questions that uh, I'm also interested here. So this is uh, what we will see, uh, how we can uh, somehow understand this, this path here, what we call the computation interface. If there's any relation with geodesics and so on. So this is also a, a simulation of, of the competition interface in this, with this <coughs> type of initial condition. It was made by, by James Martin from Oxford, a, a friend of mine. And um, so, this is the, so this is the limit shape, which is expressed by this function f. So you, you see that there's a, like a deterministic limit shape here. And this is what this is given by this function f. And in that case, it's a, I would just write it down here. It's just the square root of x plus the square root of y. So the square. And, and then, then you have this, this path, which is what we call the competition interface, which separates the red and the, the blue regions. And I, will, I want to know if this, this path has some sort of drift. So, OK. So of course, you can also consider competition interface in different models. So this is a simulation also from, from Martin, from James Martin, uh, in the first passage percolation contest. So this is the limit shape of the first passage model. And then you have, here I start the competition interface with not, uh, not with two colors, but we have like four colors here. So you have the competition interface between the red and the blue, the red and the yellow, and the green and the yellow, and the green and the blue. Yeah, so this is um, another geometrical aspect that we want to study in this, uh, in this mini course. OK, so to, uh, to, to attack this, uh, this problem, uh, what we were going to do is we're going to uh, use the concept of uh, semi-infinite geodesics and Busemann functions. So let me explain you just briefly what, what, what are they. So I think Eric will spend some more time talking about Bismarck functions and, and uh, this type of limiting. So. So this theorem A is just saying the following. So think of, so I have the zero here. So think of x as being zero, the origin of the, the lattice. And uh, I will take point n, n here. And then I will take the path, the geodesic from zero to n, n, OK? So this is a finite geodesic. It's well-defined object. And what I want to do is to see, you know, what is the behavior when I, when I do, when n goes to infinite, okay? Here I'm taking a equals to, I'm taking the diagonal direction, okay? Going along the diagonal direction. And I'm sending n to infinite, so this is what is written there in this theorem A, is that this limit exists P from uh, 0 to n times uh, 1, 1. And this limit is unique, and I will denote it by pi 0 in direction A. Yes, pi for the path. OK, so the finite geodesic is pi from x to y. And the semi-infinite geodesic is pi from 0 in the direction given by the slope A. OK? So if you fix the, the slope, then almost surely you have convergence and existence. And, uh, and I hope uh, Eric will uh, spend some time explaining you how you can prove such, uh, 
such type of result. Okay, but essentially what we are going to do, you're going to use the, the fluctuations, so upper bounds for fluctuations of less passage times to generate upper bounds for fluctuations of geodesics. Because you can imagine that, uh, you know, if I take this straight line from zero to n, n, so the geodesic will somehow fluctuates around this diagonal. It cannot get, go very far. So you can control somehow how big can be this uh, exponent chi. And as soon as you can control this, then you can show uh, convergence of paths. Okay? You can show the convergence of this finite path to this uh, semi-infinite path, what I call this semi-infinite geodesic, so in the direction 1, 1. Okay? So, but we have some, uh, another, uh, no, uh, most surely, um, so if you take, you know, if you don't fix the direction, then you don't have uniqueness. You might have convergence along some, some sub subsequence, but you don't have uniqueness of this path here. You can actually see, uh, for instance, uh, the competition interface for instance, here, you will see that you know, the competition interface have a random direction. This is what we will see here. And uh, in this random direction, you will have a semi-infinite geodesic coming from the red side and a semi-infinite geodesic coming from the right, from the, the blue side. So in some random directions, you have uh, no uniqueness of semi-infinite geodesics. Okay. So, but we have some other properties some, uh, that are, that will be fundamental for us. And uh, so this is the second uh, item here, which is the, what we call the coalescence of geodesics. That is, so I fix A, and I take the geodesic starting from, 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 from X here, and I take some other Y here. And what it's saying that it's, it will coalesce at some point C, and then go together forever. So this is, uh, stands for, so the, the semi-infinite geodesic from X in direction A will be just the semi-infinite geodesic from X to C, from X to C, the finite geodesic, concatenated with the semi-infinite geodesic started uh, at C and going to infinite in this direction. Okay? And then you have the property for both. And uh, so with this result, we can define what we call the Busemann function. And the Busemann function is just, uh, I will write it here. I just take the difference between them. So B plus A of X, Y, just the last passage from I to C minus the last passage from X to C. Okay? And uh, so I put a, a plus here to mean that I, I'm, uh, you know, looking at the directions uh, that goes in the first quadrant, you know, like this A plus B then one plus B. But uh, of course I could do the same not going uh, like this, but going uh, in the other direction, in the other sense. So, so I could do the same, like I take x here, take y here, and uh, take the semi-infinite geodesic going in this direction instead, and then define the Bismarck function. So I would put the minus here in a similar way, okay? Here is, means that I'm going in the direction minus one minus a instead of going in the direction one. Okay. Yeah. So this is a, again a picture of of the coalescence of two semi-finite geodesics 
And uh, so questions that we are interested to study is, so how are the, the fluctuations of this geodesics along the, the straight line? So can we characterize what is the, the size of this, of this difference here? So what, what is the behavior of the coalescence time? So you can think, how long does it take for two uh, geodesics to coalesce? And uh, this is an interesting question, too, that we will try to understand here. And uh, can, we, can we say something about the distribution of Bussemann functions? OK? And actually, what we will see is that this, this, quest, this question here is actually fundamental to understand competition interfaces and geodesic forests. We will see how we can, from, from the understanding of Bussemann functions, we can understand what is the geometry of competition interface in uh, geodesic forest. Okay? Yeah, so actually the starting point is will be this one here. So I hope that uh, yeah, Eric will explain you a little bit more about this, this construction here. And, and, uh, but what I am to do is to go from the construction on and see what, what kind of applications we can do as soon as we have the existence of Bussemann functions and that we have you know, the knowledge of the distribution of the Bussemann functions, what we can do with this kind of tool to understand the competition interface uh, geodesic forest and coalescence times of semi-thin geodesics. Okay? So, uh, yeah, so we still have some time. Sorry, which function? The Boosman function? Um, so can, can you repeat your question? So, what is, so this, the definition is, is, is very clear. If there is any point x and y that uh, such that the Bussemann function equals to zero, in in, in this context, no, because <coughs> it, it's continuous uh, distribution. Yeah, it's a continuous distribution, and x and y are discrete. Points. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but if you put some, I mean, I was thinking in, in hyperbolic geometry, Bussemann functions in whatever you said, some kind of power cycles. Yeah, okay, so uh, I think that if, if, if you take to the level sets of Bussemann functions, uh -huh. that's what you are looking at. You're like, if you, what is it, the, you know, the, the interface of the set of B, X, Y is less or equal to some, some value. Yeah, yeah you, you will see that this is, uh, this, this interface is actually connected to the evolution of this interface too, somehow, but in a particular context, okay? So you, you can define the level sets of Bussemann functions. And you, you, we can actually describe very well what, what are they in this context. Yeah. We will see that actually the, the level sets of Bussemann functions are essentially uh, random walks. Uh, random walks. Uh, of course, the, the parameter will depend on the direction of the Bussemann function. But as soon as we have this distribution of the description of the Bussemann function, then we can somehow, um, uh, yeah, we can have a very uh, precise description of the level sets of Bussemann functions. Okay. Yeah. But, um, So let me describe how you can uh, actually um, compute the distribution of the Bussemann function. How you can um, 
you know, have some information. So let me put this question here. Just to keep it in mind, that's, that's what we want to do. So this distribution. So to do this, uh, I will introduce what is what we call the last passage percolation fluid system. And uh, so here is what the definition of this thing. But I will do a picture here. I think it's better if we explain it like that. So so you can see this as a Markov process. And um, so the state space is the space of uh, somehow measures on, on Z. OK, so this is Z, for instance. And I will have a, like a measure nu. And I will call nu, nu K, KL is just the total amount of mass in the interval from K to L. OK, so you have mass, a mass distribution here at time 0. No, for instance. You have it at each point. You have some. Essentially, what you have is at at, at each point you have some some value. For instance, uh, 1.1, 1.9, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9
Yeah, so this is another, uh, this is one possibility, this is another possibility. And then you have this, so the, the process itself is defined as the difference between the last passage with, bound, with uh, weight, uh, boundary weights new uh, from L to N and, and the, the last passage from uh, new to KN. So you take the difference, for instance, if this is point L here and this is point K, so you have another one here. And so the total amount at time N will be the difference between the last passage from LN and the, the last passage from KN. Okay? So N is time for me. So this defines a evolution in the space of mass in Z. Okay? And that's what we call the LPP fluid system. And uh, uh, we say that the uh, initial measure is invariant for this, this system if, if you have this uh, invariance. You know, if the distribution of m n nu is equal to the distribution of nu for all n bigger than zero. If you evolve the system, you don't change the initial distribution. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, I, as I said, this is not well defined for all nu. So you, you have to assume that uh, when you go to minus infinity, then you have to, to pay at least something. Otherwise, you would just go to minus infinity forever, too. You know, and then L will be infinite. Yes, yes, yes. It has some, uh, in, some positive uh, intensity. That's the assumption. The limb length of that is positive. Okay, so this is a well-defined Markov process, and, uh, and the connection between Bussmann functions and this uh, fluid system is that actually the Bussmann functions gives you the unique family of ergodic invariant measures for this LPP fluid system, and that's what I think um, Eric will spend some time explaining you. So how you can prove this this kind of theorem. And uh, so let me just explain you a little bit more. So I will take as initial measure, so think of this as z at time zero here. So my initial measure will be new, what I will call new a from k to l. I would just take the Bussmann function, now go in the direction minus one minus a, okay? I will take just the Bussmann function from k zero to l zero, which is, which is represented here. It's just the difference between the last passage from here to c and the last passage from here to c. So this, I will take this as my initial measure. And uh, so Eric will show you that this, this measure is actually invariant for the LPP evolution. And he will also show that uh, this is actually the unique family of uh, ergodic invariant measures for the LPP series. And this is indexed by, by the slope A, which somehow you can see as the, as the intensity of your measure. Okay. And so as soon as we have this theorem, then we can try to see, to compute what is the Bussmann function by trying to find by hand uh, some invariant measure for this model. And as soon as we, we can actually show out, this is, so take this new and uh, just do some computation and check that this is invariant. So using this theorem, then you will have the connection with the Bussmann functions because the Bussmann function is the unique family. So you have to, to match them. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so in the exponential model, which is a very particular model, in some sense, that you can do some computations and you can compute it explicitly. Most of the case, you cannot do it. But uh, yeah, in exponential and also, if you take geometric weights, you can also do computations and, and see what, what happened with the Bismarck function. So I will not explain you, uh, you know, the proof of this theorem. But I will explain you how you get uh, the connection with, with the, the invariant measure for the, the, for the, the LPP system. Okay? And then you can get the, the description of the Bismarck function in that case. So before that, let uh, me just mention that uh, somehow the solvability of the Bismarck function in, for this model 
will allow us to answer some of the previous questions concerning competition interface, geodesic forests, and uh, quality times. So this is the, the, the objects that we were interested in. Okay, so let me uh, explain you. So let me do some calculations here for the for the invariant measure for the fluid system. And uh, so I, I will take a, a slightly different model here, where I will put the the initial measure. So here I before we have this, the initial measure along, along Z, okay? But I will, I will focus uh, on the calculations on, on finite box for a similar uh, last passage percolation. And uh, so here, here I have uh, on the book, I have this IID, the same IID exponential with parameter one. So along the, along the horizontal axis, I will put uh, exponentials with parameter 1 minus rho. And uh, along the vertical axis, I will put exponentials with parameter rho. And then I have the last passage percolation time, which I define in the same, uh, the same way as before. Okay? So no, just notice here that I... So in this model, I define it as the supremo of what you pick from the boundary plus what you pick... Uh, from the last passage, from the point to point last passage. But I could also have defined uh, in a similar way, just taking, you take the path and then you sum the weights here. With, so if you go right, then it's positive. If you go left, it is negative. And then you just maximize over all possible paths. You could have the same, uh, with, with, you will get the same, uh, same uh, object here. OK, so here in the finite box, I'm doing this. So just. If I go up, then I will pick the, so the yellow weights, and then I go in the book, and I will just pick the black weights, which are given by the exponentials, one or our exponentials, with different parameters at left. OK? So I will denote this new environment by omega rho, meaning that you have a, dependent, a dependence on, on the parameter rho, OK, along the boundary. And uh, so I will define some uh, auxiliary uh, variables. So this is uh, so the, this is the difference of the last passage times in the in a fixed line at h uh, at j, okay? So I have a, a the horizontal line at h. So I take just the increment from i from i minus one to i, okay? And I do it similar for the 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 vertical line at i. So I just take the increment from j minus one to j. And uh, so I can just rewrite those variables as uh, this form, which will be uh, useful for us to make calculations. So to, to see why this is true, you just, you know, just rewrite this. So this guy here is just, uh, you have this, um, You have this uh, backward uh, property for less passage times. In general, what, what does it mean? So for instance, if you have a point here, then of course the, so you have to end up at, at this point. So of course the less passage time will, will have to pass all over this point or over this point. So the less passage time from here to there it's just, uh, so you take what is the maximum over these two guys, and then you just sum the last passage at, uh, at this point here. So that's, it's written there. Because you, you always have to sum this guy here. Okay. So then you just sum and subtract this, this amount here, and then just re re rearrange them to, to get the, these two formulas here. It's just, Okay, so then we'll also define this new uh, variable x y minus one j minus one as this mean, the minimum between these two increments, and uh, we will see later that this is somehow important to 
to start what we call the reverse it process, the reverse it less passage fluid system. Okay. Okay. So so this is lemma one. It is actually the 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 the, the one step that uh, we can do calculations and then see that uh, everything goes fine with this one step, and then we see with this lemma we can prove the we can actually see what is the invariant measure for this last passage fluid system. So this lemma is a very uh, easy exercise for, for um, graduate or even undergraduate students. Is that, uh, suppose you have uh, you know, some variable i, which is just exponential with function of one minus rho, and j is exponential with function of rho, and you also have some other variable which is exponential with function of one. Suppose that they are independent, and then you just define i, j, and x, you know, with this formulas here. So I will be just this previous I minus J positive part plus exponential one, and J will be this previous I minus the previous J plus exponential one. Okay? So you have, you start with three uh, variables, and then you define these three new variables. And uh, so the lemma says that if you do this, then what you get, just the same, a copy of what you started. So they have just the same distribution. And to prove this, you just compute the, the moment generation function and show that they are equal. And uh, you'll see here just a very uh, simple computation here. You just do the some integrals with exponentials. And then you just see, oh, this is uh, the same as the same moment generation function as this, the starting vector. So it's a very straightforward computation. Okay, you just see that uh, so the moment generation function of e one j one x is just the same as the moment generation function of i j and omega. Okay. So then, uh, so this is the one step lemma. And uh, so now what you, what you want to do is to extend this one step lemma to a more general uh, profile. So what I wrote here is this, you have, suppose you have a eta, which is a down right path like this. And then you take, uh, so B eta, is uh, it's just a set of points that are strict to the left of eta. So this is B eta here. Okay. And then you define the increments along eta. So just notice that before we have, so these increments here are, you can think of, you know, we have J here, and then you take the increment from I minus one to I. Okay, in this direction. Now, what I'm doing is just define the increments along this path. So I, I take the i here, the j here, the i from here, the i here, the j here, and I keep doing this. Okay. So this is the, what I denote yk of eta. Okay, so I take y if the, the step is to the right, and I take j if the step is to the is down. Okay. So then I have these collections here. So I define this, so I will have here on the boat, I will have the collection x, z, and uh, and then along this boundary, I will have the collection Y, K. Okay, you can think of eta as a finite path, but uh, you can just extend this eta, you know, suppose eta starts from here, goes like this, and then just do that. Okay. So this defines uh, this collection. 
So the, the theorem says that this, this collection XZ and the collection um, Y are independent. And uh, that the, this X, they have a distribution exponential one, and this YK, they have distribution exponential of one minus ho, if you do like a right path, a right step, and exponential rho if you do a down step. So you take this collection here, and the collection here, so here, along this path here, you have exponentials with parameters rho and one minus rho, according to the step, the direction of the step, and here in the bulk, you still have exponentials of parameter one. Okay, so to show this, the theorem one, what we were going to do is just to use lemma one, somehow by induction, because, um, so when you start with this uh, eta here, so this is, so the, the theorem one is true just by assumption, because by assumption you start with exponentials of parameter rho here and exponentials of parameter one minus rho here. If you add one corner here, then, uh, so you will you're going to change this collection and this collection. And the, the effect of adding one corner here will just be given by this lemma. Yeah, so for instance, if, uh, yeah, so this is, so for instance, if I will just, in this case here, if I will just add this new corner here, so what will be the difference uh, on, on the, the collections? So here, I, so here I will just keep the same thing. So I will have a new variable here corresponding to this point here, to this new corner here. And uh, so the difference at beta, will just, I will just add this point here to beta. Okay? And so this, the change on the set of variables will be that, uh, you know, I have an increment corresponding to this guy, an increment corresponding to that guy. And I will also have this x which will correspond to this new point I add here. So this guy will be just replaced by this triple. And this triple will be a function of this guy, this guy, and the weight omega here. So then I just need to use lemma one again to say, okay, so by lemma one, this guy will be just independent of the previous variables. And I keep doing this. So every time I, I just add a one corner, I just use lemma one again and again and again. So in this way, you can uh, just prove theorem one just using lemma one repeatedly. Just this one step repeated for every eta. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, so this is... Uh, So one consequence of, of this uh, theorem is that, uh, so I have, suppose now we, I have the, the less passage fluid system with the, in the finite box here. And uh, so I look at the amount from K to L here at time L, okay? So, So this, this amount here, I can just rewrite this as a sum of, you know, this, the amounts here, here, and there, okay? Just the sum. And uh, when I compute the amount here, I will just sum the i variables, which are the increments along the horizontal line. And by 
by theorem one, these i variables are just exponentials of one to one minus rho, which is the same distribution, which is our exponentials of one to one minus rho, which is the same distribution as I get here. So I was, we were, were able to compute what is the invariant measure for the fluid system for the, the finite box model. OK? And you can also do the same calculations here. You can, if you compute the, the weights along this path, you can just sum the j variables, which are exponential of parameter rho, which is the same distribution as what we have here. So it's not hard to see uh, how you can extend this result from finite box to the original uh, less passage fluid system. One way of understanding this is that when you have the original uh, less passive system and you if you are just you know looking at the finite interval here so you for instance you have this the last passage from here to the boundary mu and the last passage from here to the boundary mu so somehow you can see that uh, with very high probability this difference will just be the same as if you just take a finite box and look at the last passage in this finite box. So you can extend the results from finite box to the system with infinite uh, initial configuration by just doing this kind of argument. And for instance, this is just some large m, and then you send this large m to minus infinite. And for finite box, you, you always have the same distribution here, so you should have the same distribution when you start with the general mu. OK, so uh, that's, uh, um, so I, I will write it down there, the result. I will write it here. And it's, uh, it says that, uh, so if you have like this path eta here, and you take uh, this increment here, given by the Biusma function, then you know, you know the distribution that you get. Okay, so if you do like this, then you get exponential, so it's one man row, and if you do like this, you get uh, exponentials of parameter. You just have to be uh, pay attention to the sign here because it depends on the sense you're doing, but uh, we, uh, we will see uh, how it works. So, so before uh, I, I talk about the shape, uh, let me uh, just uh, announce this. So this is a theorem. So as soon as we know uh, what is the invariant measure, and we have this theorem that says that the Biusman functions gives you the unique family of invariant measure. So we, we can match them and see what is the distribution of the Biusman function. So the distribution of the Biusman function should be given by the same, uh, the same variables that we have you know, compute here. And this is uh, the, the, the basic theorem that we will use all the time to understand competition interface and, and the geodesic curves. That you, again, if you, if you take a path like this, you know, down right, then along this path, you, you know what, how the, the increments according to the Biusman function, how they, what are the distribution of them. They will, all, they will be all independent and will be given by this uh, distribution here. You have exponentials of rho or one minus rho. Then rho, of course, here we have, the, we have to match rho with the A. And this is the formula which matched them. And, uh, 
Now, to understand why this formula should be true, is just you, you have to see that uh, uh, if you fix a direction a, then the Bussemann function in this direction and the shape function they should they should be the same value. So rho and a should satisfy this formula, and then you you get rho from a from this formula. You just okay. So let me um, go back to the, the limit shape. So one, one also one uh, interesting application of this computation is how can you get the limit shape just by knowing what is the invariant measure? Okay, and uh, so as I said before, you you have a you can use the subadditive regardless theorem to prove conversions of, of less passage, point to point less passage times to a function, to a deterministic function, which is superadditive, concave, continuous, homogeneous, and symmetric. And I will explain to you how you can actually get uh, that in the exponential case, this, this is the function you get. So, so before that, uh, so I, what I'm going to do is just, I will use again the subadditive regardless theorem for the the model with the boundaries, okay? So I have the, this last passage, points to point last passage, and I have this last passage with, you know, with weights on the boundary. So again, it's also uh, super additive. So if you multiply it by minus, I have subadditivity, and then I can use again the subadditivity regarding theorem. So you have a similar uh, result, but now you have a different function, f of rho, and for this function, you can actually compute what is this very easily. Why? Because you can just, um, um, yeah, let me, uh, so, the, so let me denote, So L rho is the last passage with boundaries that I have one minus rho here and rho here. So I can write L of rho to point, for instance, uh, n a times n. I can just write it as L. Okay, I will. I will. Uh, so I, I'm looking at uh, the L rho from here to here. So this is point n n. So I will write this as uh, L rho from here to here plus L rho from here to here. Okay? So what is this? So this is L rho. Um, so this is point And this is x, this is y, so this is 0 n, okay? Um, and this guy here is, so from here to here is, so this is L rho from n to a n minus L rho from 0 to n. Okay, so I just sum and subtract this. So now along this path here, this is just sum of exponentials of parameter rho. And by theorem one, so if I take this difference from here to here, this will be again exponentials, but with parameter one minus rho. They're not independent, but I don't need it because I just want to see what is the asymptotic behavior of this. So I don't and uh, so if I take expectations here, so if I take expectations of L rho from L zero n, so just, so this is sum of i d random variables, sum of i d random variables, so I can compute it. And uh, what I get is exactly this. So here I get exponentials of prime to rho, so y over rho, and here I get exponentials of prime to one minus rho, so x over one. Okay, and uh, and of course, uh, so just recall we have this 
formula for the L row here. Of course, here it's a, bit, a little bit different because nu is along the end, but you have the similar formula for the, for the model on the box. And uh, so this will imply a corresponding, uh, the same, a similar formula for, for relating F row with F. Remember, it's a, so L row is just what you pick on the boundary plus what uh, the last passage from Z2. So, you, so just taking the limit on both sides, you, take this, you get this formula for the, the asymptotic shapes of both uh, functions. And uh, so as soon as you have this kind of formula, you can use what we call this convex duality to compute uh, what actually F is. Because you can identify this as some sort of uh, transform of F. And you can do the dual transform, which gives you the same. And then you, what is known as convex duality. This, this, so you know what is this, and you want to compute this. So you have here and here. So you can just somehow pick the dual from the dual and uh, get what F should be by doing some uh, just calculus, basic calculus. Okay, so, it's, uh, so the message is essentially that as soon as you know what is the invariant measure or the limit shape for the, the, the invariant model, then you can compute what is the limit shape for the, somehow, for the point-to-point the -point model. Okay? In, so you, you also have a limit shape for the, so we call that the, so in the beginning, we have this, this general uh, initial, initial curve, so the curve to point last passage percolation time. So, so what we did was we just compute the limit shape for, the, for this initial uh, boundary, which is corresponds to the point to point. But you, you also have a shape theorem if you start with this kind of curve. And this is what is given here. So let me show you a picture. So you will have this straight lines here and then a, a curved piece and then a straight line there. And uh, so this, this line here corresponds to this M plus and M minus. So what, this is what we call the, the, the high refraction uh, region. So in, in the refraction region, you have the same shape function. And uh, outside, you have the straight line given by the same uh, Inclination of your initial uh, your initial condition. Of course, here I'm I'm assuming that uh, I am assuming that uh, we are in the what we call the rarefaction time regime. That is, this you have this kind of uh, initial boundary. You you could have something like this. Then the limit shape will be, you have like a shock, and the limit shape will be like this, and in this case, the limit shape will be like this. But in my picture, I only put, in this theorem, I only put this, this case here, which for us, in this course, will be the most interesting one. Okay? Yeah, so this is, um, this is the result, and um, so in the, I think I will more or less uh, stop here, but just, just mention that in the, in the next lecture, we will study the, the competition interface, and we will link, so the behavior of the competition interface with the Biosman function, how we can get uh, results about this competition interface by using theorem T. For the competition interface, and also for the the geodesic forest. Okay, that's what we're going to do in the, second, in the, the next lecture. Okay, I think this is a, a good point for me to stop. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No, I have a question. So in your initial configuration on the sites, you're always assuming that this is an exponential identity. So um, Yeah, so, so for, 
to define that fluid system, you don't need to assume that. You just, as, as uh, Kostya mentioned, you just have to assume some sort of uh, uh, intensity of your initial measure in the in minus infinity, mm -hmm. such that this, uh, let me, uh, yeah, so, so you, you, you have this, your initial measure of you know, mass along V. And uh, so, so that this formula makes sense, you have to assume that this supremum is finite. So you get that this is actually finite. So to have that this supremum is finite, you somehow, for instance, one, one, one assumption is that uh, if you take the limit of mu z divided by z and mm -hmm. take the same z to minus infinity, this is positive. Okay. Under this assumption, you see that this, this is well. So, so you can define the fluid system for to general mu as soon as you have this. You know. And what we show is that the, if you start with exponential ways with parameter one minus rho, you know, take into account that if you go right, then you sum, mm -hmm. and if you go left, then you subtract, you have minus, you pay. Then this will be the invariant, the unique uh, invariant uh, distribution for the entropy. The way we did it was, you know, considering the Bismarck functions, showing this general result of Bismarck functions, and uh, actually in the lattice model, we cannot be so general as we wish, but for the model that uh, Eric will talk, we, we, we have much more structure, we can actually do some more general terms. But, uh, yeah. So it's essential that in the following is exponential one. Yeah, if you don't know what the limit is because you, know, it's, you don't have it, any good candidate for the guy measure, it's, it's much harder in the lattice, in this sense. Yeah, so, that, uh, so the difference is that uh, if we evolve the system, then you will converge to, to exponentials. The parameter row depends on the speed. 